our first panel today is about power and trust. What are the consequences when we centralize power in our government, but people trust our institutions and each other less? I am very pleased to welcome our moderator, Ramesh Banuru, editor at National Review and a contributing columnist at the Washington Post, who will lead this conversation. Welcome. And he's joined by Veronique de Rougy, George Gibbs Chair in Political Economy and Senior Research Fellow at Mercatus Center, as well as Casey Maddox, Vice President for Legal and Judicial Strategy at Americans for Prosperity, and our street's very own James Walner, who is a Senior Fellow on our Governance Team and Lecturer at Clemson University. So I hope you all enjoy this first panel discussion. And with that, I'll pass it off to Ramesh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The, uh, the official title of our panel is One Ring to Rule Them All, which is a uh, reference, of course, to the absolute and somewhat dangerous power that I have as the moderator. Um, I, will, I will try to use it responsibly, but we know from Acton that, that power corrupts. Um, we are talking uh, secondarily uh, about the way that centralization um, can corrode trust and the manifold consequences that can have. And I thought, Veronique, as our economist on the panel, you might be able to shed some light on the role that trust or its diminishment has on our economy and, and how centralization affects it. Yeah, thank you, Ramesh, and thanks for having me. And I also thank you for trusting me. I thought no one trusted economists anymore, and I wouldn't blame them. So, um, I mean, it's a pretty vast question, but here is, here is the, the gist of it, right? We have a government that has been centralized. I mean, we can see it in many different ways, the growth in the regulatory states, the growth of government. Um, like, I mean, like the debt is what, $33 trillion. Public debt is $26 trillion. Um, and, uh, and of course, I mean, regulations like rule our lives. Uh, it doesn't really matter where you live in the US anymore because the federal government is actually your master, right? The biggest tax bill you always pay is your federal taxes. The, the most stringent regulations that you face um, are, are the federal taxes. That said, um, because of uh, Adam Millsap, I've actually kind of come to realize how local government and state government could be actually pretty, uh, pretty abusive too. Um, but so in, in that context, right, I mean, this is evidence about the extreme centralization. And what is the cost of this, right? We've been told that actually this is, this is a good thing, right? More government means more safety, uh, highest return, bigger, uh, like, you know, more vibrant growth. And what we observe is that actually it's not quite what was advertised. Economic growth in the U.S. has is, 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 is declined quite significantly in the last 20 years. And in a lot of ways, the way to, to basically kind of uh, uh, talk about the position, the U.S. position on, uh, on policy has been that we've made a choice of stagnation, right? And the reason, and this is how it relates to trust. Um, in a really, um, economists have always talked about the importance of economic growth, right? You know, it's like it lifts all boats, it makes, and especially it is, it is powerful for lower income people. But one of the things that we've actually overlooked is the moral aspect, the ethical aspect of growth. And there's a really great book um, that uh, was recommended to me by actually our street fellow, Adam Thier, here, which is a book by Benjamin Friedman, which is, which is criminally uh, underrated, uh, called The Moral Consequences of Economic Growth. And in there, it actually talks about how decline in growth effectively leads to tribalism. It leads to, I mean, he talks about actually all the, 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 the moral and ethical side of growth that we economists overlook. And that is, you know, it breeds tolerance, it breeds trust, 
it breeds all those things that we value, like uh, tolerance for, rel for religious differences. It breeds like health, um, all sorts of really things that we rarely talk about. And the reverse is also true. And as a result, right, less economic growth means more tribalism and, in effect, less trust among another. That's what tribalism effectively is. Less tolerance. And I think we can see it everywhere. So I think this is kind of like the, the, the summary of how I kind of bind all these things together, centralization. Um, centralization leads to lower, small, you know, like less growth, and, and then growth has all these uh, implications. And this is true, by the way, that slower growth breeds all sorts of tribalism and intolerance and lack of trust, even in economy that are still rich. Right? So it really applies to us. Thank you. Casey, I think the central fact of our politics, a lot of observers would agree, I certainly believe, is polarization, and particularly negative polarization. Um, but we don't often think about that as a function or as being related to the centralization of power, should we? Yeah, you know, I think we, we have to. So I mean, just think about the, the phrases you are very likely to hear. Um, over the next year, right? This is the most important election of our lifetimes. This is a Flight 93 election. If we don't win, then uh, you know civilization is is doomed, right? Those are the, the kinds of things we hear all the time. And my response, and I suspect those of most of us, is to roll our eyes, um, either quietly or directly, <coughs> quote tweeting people, uh, mock people for saying such things, um, because this is something we hear <clears throat> every election, right? Uh, but what if there's an element of truth to what people are saying there? Um, what if the people we are electing are actually going to hold more power than anyone we have ever elected before? Um, what if uh, the, the people we are, are nominating are increasingly unburdened by any sense that there are constitutional limits on what they're supposed to do? Um, so, you know, in that sense, what if every election really is uh, as, just as consequential or uh, in, in the realm of as consequential as people are making them out to be? I think there are, are three realities that uh, would kind of flow from that. One is that more, the more power that one side can wield, the more we might be concerned about the other side holding that kind of power. Two, candidates and campaigns might actually be willing to cheat um, and to try to steal elections, to, uh, to falsify returns, if it really is that consequential, right? If the ring is at stake, um, it makes sense for why people would, uh, would actually be tempted uh, to actually do things that justify distrust in elections. And perhaps most importantly, it would be reasonable for people to think that given the amount of power that is up for grabs, that other people might cheat, might try to steal elections. And that perception uh, is, is really, uh, you know, just as much of a problem. I think, you know, the, so the first premise then, this consolidation of power, I think uh, uh, Vero has, has talked about that. Look, it, you know, it's it, in two different directions. One, just consolidation of power in Washington, D.C. itself. There's no sugarcoating it. You've got, I mean, we can't even agree on exactly how many federal agencies there are, um, which is the proof of the problem, right? We think it's about 438, but we're not positive. Um, depends on who you ask. Uh, you know, I think in, in Federalist 45, Madison argued that uh, the states were basically the, you know, the stars of the constitutional show. Um, and you know, the states had broad power. The federal government had very limited uh, powers. And that seems quaint uh, and foreign to us now, because it's just not how, how things operate. I think the, the, some of the largest or most powerful counties, uh, richest counties in America, uh, are the counties right around you know, where all of us probably live, right around Washington, D.C., and that's despite the fact that other than being close to Washington, D.C., the only thing we've ever given the world is five guys, right? Um, I mean, we, we don't contribute. We just basically, we just happen to have houses where the federal government is, and that makes us wealthy, um, which should be the sign that something isn't right here. Um, and so we've consolidated power in Washington, D.C., um, and then we've consolidated power specifically in the executive branch. Um, 
So there you've got, uh, you know, you have 535 people that we have actually elected um, to make laws, right? Article one, section one, even with the consolidation of power in Washington, D.C., if things worked according to the way the Constitution is designed, right? If the lawmaking power was actually in Congress, then the problem would be at least somewhat modified because, well, at least different constituencies all over the, all over the country are the ones who are electing the people who are making the laws. So we're, we're safe. But it doesn't work that way because Congress has largely outsourced uh, the job to the administrative state to actually make the decisions that uh, run most of our lives. Um, so that's, that's essentially where we are. We've consolidated power. Um, and that means then Congress doesn't actually have to compromise. We have lots of decisions that are, uh, that are being, made, uh, being made by the, the executive branch that were never designed to be made there. So when we elect a president then in 2024, it actually is somewhat true that the person who's actually going to be making, uh, making those decisions, uh, the power that they're going to wield is probably more than any other president uh, has in the past. The second premise then is that this expansion of power actually has a negative impact, uh, a, a bad impact on polarization and distrust. Um, and it's expectable, I think, uh, that many Americans would look at that expansion of power um, and have a difficult time trusting given the amount of power that we're talking about handing over to someone uh, who, whose uh, opinions they disagree with. So having cited Madison, I'll point then to my second favorite um, work of uh, political literature, and that's Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So in Hitchhiker's Guide, it's actually in so long, and thanks for all the fish, but it's all part of the five-part trilogy. Um, in, uh, in the Hitchhiker's Guide, Ford Prefect, uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide researcher, um, explains to the earthling hero, Arthur Dent, um, when arriving, uh, why when arriving on Earth, the people of one particular planet would have said, take me to your lizard. Hmm. And the reason was, in its world, the people are people, the leaders are lizards. Hmm. The people hate the lizards, and the lizards rule the people. Odd, said Arthur, I thought you said it was a democracy. I did, said Ford, it is. So, said Arthur, hoping he wasn't sounding ridiculously obtuse, why don't people get rid of the lizards? It honestly doesn't occur to them, said Ford. They've all got the vote, so they all pretty much assume that the government they voted in more or less approximates to the government that they want. You mean they actually vote for the lizards? Oh, yes, said Ford, <clears throat> with a shrug, of course. But, said Arthur, going for the big one again, why? Because if they didn't vote for the lizard, said Ford, the wrong lizard might get in. <laughs> this is called effective polarization, and it's basically where we are right now. Uh, and essentially, it's, I think, a byproduct of having a government that is incredibly powerful. We're very concerned about what would happen if the wrong lizard got in. And so we, we end up making decisions based on concern that the, the amount of power people have has to be, uh, has to be reined out. So we end up with 60% of Democrats, 63% uh, of Republicans, saying that they want their children to marry someone of the same political party. More than people who say they want someone to marry someone who shares their religious beliefs, people are now saying that they want someone who shares their political beliefs, their children to marry only within the political tribe. So politics is basically taking the place uh, of religious faith. And I think that the consequences of that um, for us are, are pretty stark but I think they're pretty, pretty predictable. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of close with this. In, in Democracy in America, de Tocqueville is sort of looking at this dynamic um, and actually has hope for the American democracy because it was very different from the one that we, we live in now. So in Democracy in America, he says that um, uh, the dangers of elections of the executive, so he's, he's looking at America that's basically, you know, we have these little platoons of democracy where you know, American citizens are, are sort of associating around shared ideas and, um, and you have this diffused government where the states are actually largely the ones making decisions and certainly not the executive branch. And he says, the, the dangers of elections of the executive therefore grow in direct proportion to the influence exerted by the executive, by the executive power on affairs of state. For to wish all at once that the representative of the state remain armed with a vast power and be elected to, ex to express according to, or is to ex express according to me two contradictory wills. Basically, 
Um, and then American legislators taking uh, up their favorable circumstances had no trouble establishing a weak and dependent executive power, having created it so they could render it elected without danger. So that was then, and this is now. We now have a very, very powerful executive. And uh, we nevertheless continue to, everyone all over the country, elect that executive. And I think it's uh, a predictable consequence of the, the sort of size and growth of government that we've seen and the power of the presidency and the sort of potential power of the presidency when each president of both parties is kicking the tires on, what if I just ignored whole parts of the Constitution and did what I wanted to do? I think it is a predictable consequence of that, that people all over the country would start to, uh, to lose that confidence that we're supposed to have uh, in each other and in the electoral process. Thank you, if I could say that after something Thanks. that gloomy. <laughs> uh, James Walner, um, Casey, of course, brought up some of the institutional um, issues that are implicated in our uh, crisis of trust in our country. You're a student of institutions, especially our political institutions, and I wonder um, whether there's there's something going on with the, not just how much government we have and how much of it's in Washington, but but how it runs that affects how our uh, how much trust we've got. Yeah, I'm still a little, you know, taken aback. You didn't quote my book, and it's not criminally underrated. Man, that would be amazing to have. Someone, that's like, I love that, criminally underrated. Um, but no, thank you all for coming. Um, this is a really important topic. This is something that is near and dear to my heart as well. And as I was sitting here listening, I was jotting down some notes to try to order my thoughts because those of you who know me, they can go in lots of different directions. And I have here, just to give you an idea, Kierkegaard, that's where we're gonna start. Then I have the problem, the consequences, the solution. Calhoun Adams, conflict with the circle around it, Erica, and then secret sauce saves institutions, gets compromise, and builds truth. And I think that's probably a good s summary of the way we're going to solve this problem. <laughs> Buckle up. Yeah. No. So Kierkegaard, what does Kierkegaard have to do with this? Well, Kierkegaard is a philosopher. He lived in Copenhagen, for those of you who don't, aren't familiar with him. And he was a bit of a quirky guy. He modeled himself on Socrates. Uh, that was one of his kind of models. And what Kierkegaard <laughs> would do is, he, when he would have guests come visit him, never get in a carriage with Kierkegaard in Copenhagen. And these uneven streets and their, you know, the rocks and stuff, I've never been there and I've never been in a carriage with Kierkegaard there, but I can imagine what it's like. And you're jostling around on these streets and it's already uncomfortable because you have these big wooden wheels. And then Kierkegaard would take the bridles and he would shorten one. He would shorten one and keep the other one long. And the result was that you would kind of be like this the whole way, and you would be so motion sick, and you were just like, please get me out of here. And then you would go to dinner, and then you would talk about philosophy all night long. And the reason why Kierkegaard did this, though, was because he wanted his guests, the people that he was interacting with, that he was in discussion and conversation with, to get outside of themselves and to see the world differently. Because we all have this world of appearances that we recognize, we see it's familiar, and it's safe, and that's what we go to. And Kierkegaard was interested in being in this moment as it exists, in this time and in this place, and not necessarily what we are comfortable with or what we want it to be. And I think that's very instructive for where we are right now, because the problem, and there is a problem, and it's significant, and it's big, and our institutions are in grave danger, I believe, because when you stop using institutions for the purposes for which they were designed, they basically are dead. They're gone. That's the problem, and it's a serious one. It's a scary one. But I don't think we fully understand the nature of the problem. Right? The common view is that we have these uh, polarized parties. We have a very cohesive um, you know, parties with, that are fueled by base voters and ideological extremists, and they centralize power so that they can enforce their view of the world and on the other party. They can block out the opposition, et cetera, and we need to stop that from happening. Right? But we don't know how because basically that puts us in an uncomfortable position of trying to you know, argue against the people, which is never a, a winning kind of argument. Just ask uh, Andrew Jackson's detractors. Um, and so is that really happening, though, when we get up close and look at it? 
right? What is the conventional, I mean, what is really going on? What are the consequences of what's going on? Well, the consequences of how we understand the world right now is that we have this centralized power, and then we basically can't get agreement because there is no compromise, there is no um, overlap, there's no more moderates. If only we had more sensible moderates. We need to get conflict out of the political process, and we need to get grown-ups back in charge. And I, I can see that. But if we look at what's really happening right now, there's a lot of disconnects, a lot of contradictions. For instance, the executive branch and the president is that it is so powerful, the leader of the free world. I mean, we stand up and clap whenever they walk in the room. I mean, think about that for a second. It's very monarchical. But the president, why is the president powerful? Have we asked ourselves this question? Like, what makes the president powerful? Like, what is it? Right? We're told they have institutional power. It goes from one person to the next. It doesn't matter. But what precisely makes the president powerful? And when we begin to go down that road, we, it's, it, it gets to be very interesting because we see that we are the ones that make the president powerful. And I don't mean the great unwashed masses and the populist or the progressives or the communists or anybody in between. It's all of us and how we think about politics and the way we want our political process to work. When in reality, we see a very powerful president, then we also see like a district court judge in Hawaii. A district court judge in Hawaii can freeze the entire executive branch in its tracks mm -hmm. with, like, with a nationwide injunction. That's like, so is the president really powerful? Is it all, is it this awesome power it's wielding? Well, if that's the case, then how on earth can a district court judge do that? Well, the answer, of course, to reconcile that contradiction is not having to do with the president or that district court judge. It has everything to do with how we understand politics. And I think the problem today with regard to Congress and with regard to the presidency and politics more generally is that we see it as a production process. We see this thing as one big factory where we are building our widgets, our policies that we want to have built because we know that's the truth. And because of that, we then, like, try to monopolize the means of production. Right? If we can think back to our kind of Karl Marx in, in college, I'm doing a lot of communist citing right now, so we'll see. But uh, you know, if we think about that- You've got the you, beard for it. You know, you know mo monopolizing the means of production. Well, how do you do that in, political, in the political process? Elections, mm -hmm. right? And then you get gavels, you get votes, you get presidents, you get Supreme Court justices, and once you get all that, it's over, you're done, you've won, congratulations. <laughs> You can just impose your view and we're good to go, but that's not how it works because politics isn't a production process and our institutions aren't factories and our representatives in Congress aren't factory line workers assembling a blueprint according, or assembling a product according to a blueprint that was designed elsewhere. They're participating in an activity on our behalf. Politics is an activity. It's not a factory process. And that activity is the point. That's the, that's the whole thing. And the beauty of politics is that the conflict that we have, both out in the streets between people who disagree, maybe I like the color red, maybe you like the color blue, I don't know. But the whole point is that that conflict prevents anybody from ultimately ruling America. James Madison tells us this in Federalist 10. He tells us this in Federalist 51. Our institutional structure is set up so that we fight. What's the solution to a president that has become too powerful? Congress telling the president no. Congress trying to impeach the president. Congress cutting the president's funding off. Maybe uh, states ignore the, the president. Like the conflict is the point because the conflict isn't the end of the story. It's just the beginning of the story. It's the first step in a process to which we then can go down this road and we can get compromise because compromise emerges out of the struggle. We can then ultimately get a better understanding of truth, right? I'm married and I did not know, I don't know how I interacted in the world before I got married. Because I, and I think most men probably agree with me on this, it's at least secretly, but you get, when you have to deal with someone and interact with someone on the basis of equality, right? When you have to go day in and day out and, and interact with someone, you begin to step outside of yourself and you can then look back on yourself maybe if you're really good, I'm admittedly probably not, but you can also then look around at the world and you can begin to see it through another set of eyes and you can get a better understanding of reality in the round and you can transcend your own narrow view. But this is not something you do like, you, like yay! Like nobody wants to do this like when they wake up in the morning, it's tough stuff. 
But that's what not having rulers is all about. It forces us to engage in these arguments instead of trying to shut people out of the process and delegitimize them and make up excuses for why they are extreme or they're not smart or they don't belong. We have to interact with them and engage and we have to argue with one another. And that builds trust. That builds trust. And if we look back to John C. Calhoun, he advocated for the moral good of slavery. Did a lot of other stuff, but he advocated for the moral good of slavery. John Quincy Adams was a fierce opponent of slavery, an abolitionist. John Quincy Adams asked John C. Calhoun to be a pallbearer at his funeral on slavery. Think about that for a second. Why? How on earth could someone who is fiercely opposed to slavery, who wants to be remembered for his opposition to slavery, ask the number one slaver to be his pallbearer? That's the kind of trust that you get when you roll up your sleeves and you step into the arena day in and day out and argue with one another. You begin to generate respect, and then you get trust. And that ultimately saves our institutions because that's what they're there for. Ambition, counteracting ambition, isn't just for when like your side wins. It's like, that's the point. You go to work every day and you argue with people. And then as you lose to them, as they have better arguments than you, maybe they have worse arguments than you, but you really respect their intellect. Whatever it may be, you begin to respect them and you see them as an individual. But until we do that, we are going to continue to ab make this whole thing abstract. We're going to see not people, but like, you know, conservatives or progressives or the Democrats or Republicans. And then it becomes very easy to have effective polarization. Because the joke about polarization is nobody agrees on anything. Yeah, I mean, if you open up the newspaper and just look at it, like, the, when was the last time we saw the Republican Party or the Democratic Party unified on a policy in a substantial, substantive way over a sustained period of time? Right. But yet we still are like, we're all polarized. And it's the effect of polarization and it's the absence of conflict that makes the effect of polarization possible. And we would see very rapidly that there are plenty of Republicans that are to the left of the most conservative Democrat. And there are plenty of Democrats to the right of the most conservative Republican. It just depends on what day of the week you catch them on, what issue you're asking them about, and how specific you're getting. And I think we, in that rich diversity in America, it's still there. It's still there. And I think it's, uh, we can save it, but it's not, it's not looking great right now. Sure. Yeah, I, so I mean, I agree mostly with what you said. That said, I actually think um, Congress and the administration and the di varied administration actually, they agree on way more than I wish they agreed. As you can see through the continuation <laughs> of enormous spending from one administration to the other. I mean, what you, what, what you don't see is you don't see a hike in spending in one administration and the other administration working to actually go, you know, cut the spending, or in the same thing with like the Trump tariffs are still there, right? And so I actually think that, I mean, I agree, like the, 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 the big point, but I, th I think that these guys actually agree on, on a ton of things, right? We focus a lot on the gridlock, on the things that they go at each other uh, for, but when you look at, like, there's barely any disagreement on passing enormous farm bill, which include growing and growing, growing amount of food stamps in it. Um, there's like, there's, there's a whole like core of government programs that are never in discussion, you know, entitlement in particular. There's a, there's a really uh, sh chilling consensus right now between Democrats and Republicans on not touching entitlement spending. Meanwhile, I actually think that the American people um, are more in agreement on, on some issues than, than we are led to believe by listening to actually those who are, um, are just you know, the most vocal. Now, does it make much of a difference that I bring this clarification? Probably not, because ultimately the decision of power and those who are like pulling us out if we refuse to engage in the conflict that you highlighted, um, it just, it, if we continue to be silent and to not be willing to speak up to say when we have disagreement and to engage in a conversation, it won't make a difference that the American people agrees more than we think. Um, and so anyway, 
I don't know if that's important at all, but. Casey? Yeah, I mean, so I, I think I will agree in the sense that I, I think the, there, there are at least two things that most members of Congress agree on. One is that uh, they really like power um, and they would like to keep it. Um, they'd like to continue returning to Washington, D.C. And two is that they don't actually want to be held accountable for exercising that power, right? So that, that's sort of how we end up in this problem is you have, um, you know, it's not that, uh, like, the, the system was created so that you would actually have this sort of tension between the, the branches of government and that would help to solve the problem. And, but then I think somewhere along the way we've realized, members of Congress realized that, well, but if, if we take power from people and from states, but we hand it over to somebody else, then we can talk about it. Um, we can uh, you know, be members of Congress with all this power without actually being responsible for the exercise of it. So I think that's the, uh, maybe that's the, the sort of meeting mm. here. I think they, they do have a lot in common, um, but it tends to be uh, the, the sort of agreement that we should continue coming here. So let me, um pose a challenge to some of the ways that we think about these twin problems of distrust and centralization and, and use COVID uh, and COVID policies an ex as an example um, in both cases. So first on trust, is the problem really so much that we have a, a crisis of trust or that we have a crisis of trustworthiness? Um, so it seems to me that you know it's a, it's a mistake to act as though so our trust in experts ought to be at 100%. Uh, I, mean, I think we can all think of examples during COVID when um, experts claimed more uh, confidence than was actually warranted um, and behaved in ways that, that undermined uh, confidence. There's got to be a, sort of an optimal level of trust. Um, but I wonder if, if we're looking at things from the wrong side in thinking about trust instead of trustworthiness. Second. We're talking about centralization, uh, but it also strikes me that a lot of the lack of accountability, Casey, that you're talking about is a product of a kind of disintegration of authority. And COVID, I think, is another example of this where um, the governors, you know, imposed lockdowns and said, well, we're just following what the CDC tells us. And you know, Anthony Fauci says just a couple months ago, well, we didn't, we didn't impose a lockdown. We just made recommendations. The governors were free to, to set policy. We're not the decision makers. And it seems to me that that is, that is one high profile example of something that happens all the time in our government where there is no obvious, clear decision maker to hold accountable uh, and, the, and the buck stops nowhere. Um, in, in which case, maybe the way we think about centralization and central planning is mistaken because we don't have a plan. I agree. <laughs> the, um, you know, on one hand, it's the rule of nobody, right? Yeah. The idea that you know, there is a ruler, and technically we're not supposed to have rulers in America. We have to remind people that. Not the majority, not the minority, not any one person. Nobody rules. It's a pretty unique thing. But the rule of nobody, because there's nobody to hold accountable in that, in that sense. When I think about trust and centralization of power, though, I think that we've had periods in the past where we've had centralized power. We've had untrustworthy people in positions of power, and the trust has been high. And I can think of, I mean, th just the end of the 90s with, with Bill Clinton, for instance. When he left office, he could have probably won another term in office had he been allowed to run, right? This trust is, is not the first word I think about yeah. in, uh, but, in but relation you to You see this thing kind of Clinton. playing, and, and this is Republicans always are like tortured about the Clintons, right? Yeah. But if you also think on the other side of it, go back to the 60s and the high modernism in the academic circles, and um, you have McNamara at the Pentagon, and essentially the idea that expertise can solve our mm -hmm. problems, and it comes crashing down in like a major way, that at least it didn't then. And out of that conflict, out of that distrust, came one of the most, if not the most, productive periods in lawmaking, of lawmaking in our nation's history. And so what's the, what's the difference between then and now? And I think it comes back to how we understand and think about politics. When we see it as a production process, it, 
it, we just we begin to put too much emphasis on elections. We try to uh, win all those elections. We do nothing in between elections to jeopardize our chances at winning those elections. We try to obscure our differences uh, in between elections so we can present a unified front because we think that's what makes us win. And the difference between today and, and the 60s, or even today and the, like, the antebellum era for that matter, is that we see our institutions as uh, these prizes to be won that we can then, once we have them, we have this power in our hand, we have a ring in our hand, and we can then fabricate, we can manufacture, we can do stuff. But that's not politics. Politics is about an ongoing activity that never ends. It's bargaining and negotiation and compromise. It's interacting with one another because there's no other choice. And right now we think about politics, though, in a, in a way that makes it very hard for that to happen. I think your, your point, though, about uh, the, I mean, the, the expertise, particularly during COVID, right? I mean, the, the thing that was the obvious piece that was missing in a lot of the high profile examples there was humility. Mm -hmm. um, and, and increasingly we see this, I mean, just basically the ability to acknowledge that this is a fast moving situation. We may not have all the answers. This is our best answer as of right now, subject to, um, you know, subject to revision, right? Mm -hmm. And instead, I think all of us, were, were, we felt like at least we were hearing a message that was, you know, this, this is the known truth. And you, you, uh, you know, anyone who's disagreeing with the known truth or questioning the known truth uh, is a, you know, a fill in the blank denier, right? Um, which would be, would be one thing if it turned out that people were 100% correct. But when you're, lar when you're very often wrong, mm -hmm. then, you know, the, the trustworthiness piece is a, is a real problem. And I think we see this with, with government generally, right? I mean, one of the, the best arguments for sort of expertise in decision making out of, uh, out of, you know, out of the government, out of the administrative state, is the expertise, uh, the, you know, the fact that, well, we need people who can, can truly be expert making some of these decisions. That works so long as you're actually talking about uh, decisions that require expertise. It's another thing when basically it's just, well, these are just political decisions being made politically, but through the, uh, through the people that you're telling me are otherwise experts, right? Um, then it's hard for people to be able to trust that, that these other decisions are truly just being made based on you know, a calculation that this is how many parts per million is actually the correct number of parts per million if the same people yesterday were the people telling me that you know, you're, you're taking some social issue and making that into an expertise decision that was really, everyone knows, just a political call. And maybe I'll add another point, which is um, in, there, there's a problem of incentives, right? I mean, think about economists. Economists, uh, I know Russ Robert used to say, economists, do you know that economists have a sense of humor? Because when they, when they're asked how much, if, how much growth in the, uh, or how many jobs um, a certain amount of money is going to, uh, to, to create, they can tell you to the second decimal, right? Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like it's gonna create like seven jobs, point mm -hmm. three, three, seven, two, whatever, right? And economists have had an incentive with a government that is so big and where it's so lucrative to actually be providing advice to government. Economists have had an incentive to become more and more assertive and, and actually um, lose a lot of the humility that should be part of our, um, our profession, if you want to call it that, um, because the world is so complex, right? I mean, uh, Hayek talked about how the role of economists is uh, is to basically explain to people how much we can't design, right? Um, and how, how it's not true that the top-down um, top design and, and central planning that people think and look goes on paper actually can come to life. And that should be the role of economists. And I think now economists, actually, that criticism applies to economists who actually have had a tremendous um, you know, incentive to, because the stake, because there's so much, how many economists are actually hired by the government? An enormous amount, maybe not as many as lawyers, but, uh, but there's still, it's very lucrative to be, to be a, an economist advising government. Um, and and they just have a tremendous incentive in actually being the one doing the designs. 
Um, and be wrong a lot, which then, this is why. Actually, people still trust economists way more than they should, in my opinion. <laughs> Present company ex excluded, right? The, uh, the, um, the, let, me, let me suggest another example. Um, so you're a landowner or a business owner and a regulatory agency, one of those 438 or so. Um, federal agencies is, is uh, making a decision you can't do something um, with your land. Who do you blame? Who do you get angry with? Who do you replace? Um, because uh, the Congress can say, well, we, we didn't mean for our law to be applied this way. And the agency can say, um, well, no, that's, that's the law you passed. And the court can say, well, the agency, they're the experts. Right? I mean, this seems to me to be a, um, an accountability problem right. um, that, that drives some of, the, some of the political problems that we're having. Is there, something, is there something that can be done? Yeah, I think there definitely is something that can be done. Uh, the thing that could be done, though, and this is, so, you know, I, I know I ended it, my opening remarks on a very negative note. Um, the positive note is that we've got an entire plan for how to fix this problem. And that's it's, why I threw this to you. It's, it's basically just Articles 1 through 3, though, right? So mm -hmm. if we just basically follow the Constitution, we could try to give this a shot. So that's, uh, um, I, I mean, but I, I think the, the positive is that we, we really do have a system here. Um, we need to actually get much more serious about expecting members of Congress to actually be responsible for the legislative role, um, expecting the executive branch to be responsible just for executing the laws that are passed by Congress and not for being the place where well, look, we tried for like a week to get a piece of legislation passed. We couldn't get it passed. So therefore, the president can write an executive order. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can take it to the courts, and either the courts will uphold it or the courts will strike it down, in which case that's a wonderful opportunity to go to the voters and tell them, we tried to do the thing for you, but the big bad courts wouldn't mm -hmm. let us. And so uh, now you need to elect more of us. Um, so that we can can you know fix the courts right like and this is basically the system we have right now and it's it's not working but the I mean the constitutional structure I think is uh, is you know ultimately the the answer to this but you're right I mean right now you have if you're a person who's been impacted by some government decision if you go to your member of Congress and tell them I want to talk to you about uh, this law that was passed right the member of Congress is basically going to be like okay first of all let me know are you do you like the way this worked out? If so, you're welcome. I worked very hard on that, and I'm glad that right. it has benefited you, right? Or if the answer is, no, this has been very bad for me, oh, man, it's a real problem the way that agency keeps enforcing this law. So I, I was totally expecting you to say yeah. that the courts can rescue us by getting rid of Chevron deference. Well, they can. And yeah, reviving the non-delegation yeah, doctrine. Yeah, right. but. All those things. That's basic. I mean, yeah. that is that's basically my hope. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think, co but Congress has a role in this too to actually like take. And the American people too. Yes. yes. I mean, I just don't understand why we tolerate stagnation. I mean, and these are choices. These are policy policy choices that have been made over the years, and we tolerate. We don't even we don't even actually build the kind of things that we built in the past. We used to be able to fly from France to New York in four minutes. In four hours, sorry, not minutes. <laughs> I haven't had lunch. Um, and so in, in four hours, and now we can't do this. We're like, you can't, you can't build uh, any buildings without taking, like, how many, re having to require how many permissions from the government, having to be subjected to how many NEPA inspection, how many. Why are we tolerating? stagnation in this country. And the fact of doing nothing and not reforming it is also tolerated. And I just don't, I just don't understand. And I think that if somehow the American people um, like kind of uh, uh, shifted their mindset and said that they won't be tolerating stagnation, they want abundance, and they will figure out, you know, they will, they will figure out that they deserve more, and that the, the, the reason why they don't have more is because the government has grown and centralization has been such. Uh, so, I mean, it's been so, so important. But how do we go about it? I think it's about, about telling people they deserve better. They deserve better than what they have and, and point to, to the reasons why we have, we have this system. And, and, and I will say, more, more than, you know, as much as I'm a big advocate of, of getting rid of Chevron and non-delegation and all those things, 
I think the most important factor there is the opportunity to um, enforce the parts of the Constitution that allow people to make decisions more locally to themselves, at least in terms of the how do we address polarization, how do we address uh, the sort of distrust in the process. I mean, to go back to the beginning, I think the way you, I, I don't see a future for how to address the distrust in each other that still has it be the case that everything that I care about is being, uh, is subject to uh, the decisions of people that I disagree with in a very different part of the country who don't, can't understand where I am. I think we have to basically get, and this is, you know, it's California being California and it's Alabama being Alabama. I think that actually allows us to, uh, to find a place where we can live together with our differences um, a lot better. Um, but that's going to require not just you know sort of the courts enforcing the constitution. It's going to require people from you know both political directions saying, look, this is actually this is what we want. I want to be able to um, you know to make decisions that affect my life much closer to where I am. All right, thank you. I think we are um, just a, about out. Are we out totally or out of? Uh, before before Q and A, or do we did we did we overran that? So sorry. I was having so much fun uh, asking um, all these great questions. I'm, I'm just going to have one last thing, which may run us over. James, when you look at what's going on in the U.S. House right now, um, is this the kind of uh, chaos and conflict that might actually be the kind of thing that we should tolerate more, or is it the sort of thing that we should be saying, no, this is a symptom of decline? Well, it's a popularly elected, you know, if we look at McCarthy being ousted, a popularly elected lawmaker using a rule that has been approved, constitutionally approved rule by a majority of the House to remove a leader that they hired to do a job for them. That's not, a, if that's a threat to democracy and, and if that makes democracy in decline, then throw the checks and balances thing out the window. I mean, it's just, it's, that's, it's not. It's not chaos. It just, it's only chaos. It's only bad if we have an idea of what the House ought to be doing policy-wise. And if this jeopardizes that, if it makes it harder for the House to get what we want in our mind out in the legislative kind of production process, then yes, it is chaos. But if you look at the House as a place where individuals go on our behalf to argue with each other and debate one another, and it's like, it's, it's actually encouraging to see lawmakers using their leverage to, on behalf of their constituents, and if they use it poorly, they're going to be ousted, and if they don't, they won't. But I think I agree with the American people. Ultimately, it comes down to us, because our system of government, and I just want to end on a positive note, it's so fabulous, because everything that we have done, if you think about the changes that have happened in America with relatively little bloodshed compared to other places in the world, if you think about the progress that we have been able to make in this social and economic and political changes that we have made within, we don't have like eight republics here, like in France or whatever they got, I don't know, we got two. The, you know, the first founding, the second founding. And the Constitution has worked. The framework has worked. It may need to be changed. Okay, people can j debate that. But the bottom line is the things that we have accomplished have come about within the constitutional structure or by using it in civil disobedience case and the suffrage movement to amend the Constitution. Mm -hmm. The Constitution works. We just have to, like, vote for people that wake up in the morning, put their feet on the ground, go to work saying, I want to win. And when that happens, you'll try to stop them if you don't like it, and then they'll try to stop you, and that's legislating. And hopefully something good happens. So we will, we will end on that uh, happy note, uh, but I hope you'll join me in thanking these great panelists for this thoughtful discussion.